think this is common knowledge, but for life, uh, everything is just a series of mistakes. <laughs> and what makes the difference in your life is how you deal with mistakes, right? We all make them all the time, and uh, they happen all the time. And I see my life as a case study in just learning from mistakes. We all know this, right? How we learn from a mistake it makes a huge difference on what we get out of life. And that's kind of common knowledge. We all think about that. If you have a mistake, what do they say? If you, if you, just, if you haven't won yet, the game's just not over. Uh, you just keep going. Um, but the more important thing, I think, around this is this. If you're so afraid of making mistakes that you never try anything big or bold or scary, I would say you get penalized even more than by that than not learning from your mistakes in the first place. Uh, there's just a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of things that happen and some people try to never make mistakes and, and frankly nothing much interesting happens if you live that kind of life. Uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of background and talk through some of the companies I've been involved with. Uh, I finished my computer science degree here in 1993 which feels like forever ago. I used to run up and down these stairs, and you could even ride the elevator to the fourth floor and get out and go across back then. Uh, you, you didn't have to do the stairs and, or have some kind of card. So when I was 12 years old, I had an uncle who was into electronics, and he taught me how to, he actually showed me how to build a computer. And so I actually soldered my own computer and wrote my own little operating system and, uh, and did all these things. And I lived really close to Estes Rockets. Anyone ever shot an Estes Rocket? So Estes Rockets is in Penrose, Colorado, which was in my stake that I grew up in. And uh, I had this idea for this digital rocket launcher that would beep and count down and show a digital display and go from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then launch the rocket automatically. And I went to Estes Rockets when I was 12 and said, if I build these for you, will you sell them in your catalog? And I actually got them to put it in the catalog. And, uh, um, but then I had, they ordered like, they didn't order very many, they ordered like 10 at first. So I had to literally get, I, I didn't have any capital to do this. I actually had a friend who had a paper route and he pre-collected three months of paper route stuff so we could get enough capital to buy the parts. And then I hired friends of mine to sit in the basement and solder these things together. And in the end, we made about 30 of them and sold them. But it was a pretty fun experience at that kind of age to kind of build a product and try to sell it and figure things out. And they looked pretty clunky and ugly, but it was, it was a fun experience. So while I was here at BYU, I, uh, when I was that kid that liked to do the electronics, I thought that it would be really cool to make a computer control things outside of the computer. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And so I had this idea about having a home where, as I walked down a hallway, motion sensors would trip and turn on and off the lights. And uh, it would only heat the rooms people were in. So if you had motion sensors in rooms, it could automatically control dampers and make sure the heat went to the right rooms. And I'd kind of dreamed this thing up when I, when I was in high school, back in like 1985 or something like that. And so I came here to BYU, had my freshman year, went off on a mission, came back, and uh, I took a job, actually, I programming up in Student Auxiliary Services, which is the part of BYU that does all the kind of for-profit stuff, the, the non-academic part. And uh, I actually wrote the back end for Signature Card. I was the very first student ever to be able to use money on a Signature Card, ever, me and four professors. And uh, because I had that job, I started looking for a condominium, because we could afford maybe better than just uh, an apartment. And, uh, we were looking and I ran into a guy, I was telling this guy that was uh, working at the, kind of showing the model home off, I, I, I told him this idea of automating my home and he says, I really like that, that's a cool idea. That could be a cool business. And we actually built a product. He, he fortunately, actually one of the classrooms up here on the second floor is named for his parents. So he was a trust fund kid. We built this product, put it in a couple homes, tried to sell it to electricians and home builders and it went nowhere. No one wanted it. We showed it in the parade of homes, it was just, it was, it was awful, and frankly, we just put the thing on ice and decided not to worry about it. And about a year later, he was going to build a house for himself over here in the River Bottoms in Provo, and uh, he wanted to put in a high-end home theater, and he went to like this high-end home theater shop, and uh, he said, he's, they're talking about home theater stuff, and the guy there that was kind of pitching him, who was one of the owners, said, well, we could do home automation for you. And my friend goes, well, we, I've got a home automation company. We don't know how to sell it. And in the end, we got together... I was kind of bummed because I found out I didn't invent the concept. There were other people thinking about this, but I was very glad there was a channel we could sell it through. Uh, the funny thing is we built a product, we got it out there, people were very interested in it, and uh, before we even got out to revenue though, a, a bigger company found out about us and bought us. And they had recently bought a company that did media retrieval, which is distributing of audio and video uh, signals through college campuses. I mean, right now that seems pretty simple. You just 
go to YouTube and you watch the video, right? But back then, this was, we're talking about VCRs and laser disc players. The DVDs didn't exist back then. Uh, this was a kind of a complex technology, but routing audio and video signals in college campuses. Uh, and so we pivoted the business to that when they, we got acquired and uh, became the world leader in media retrieval. Uh, all the Case, West, Case Western Reserve, all the Ohio State schools, all the Texas schools, uh, Notre Dame, Ball State, almost everyone but BYU. I came here and pitched BYU on that, but uh, BYU sometimes likes to build their own stuff. And so we, we were unsuccessful selling to BYU. But uh, I learned a lot here. Um, I had to pivot for success. I didn't understand what I was doing. I, I thought that uh, I had the perfect idea, but it wasn't. I had no idea what channel, how to sell it. I under, didn't understand. I, I really just was focusing on something I wanted, and I wasn't thinking about how you sell it to other people. And I wasn't thinking about how they, what their needs were. And the funny thing about home automation is changing today, but for the past 26 years, home automation has been mostly driven by entertainment systems. People are willing to pay for a fancy home theater that they can have their friends over, or a multi-room audio system. They've been historically not willing to pay a lot for lighting control. And until the last two years, probably 90% of all people that have smart lighting in their home, it was installed or sold by an AV guy, which was counterintuitive to me originally, but that's how the market's been. Now the market's changing a little bit, and uh, you've got Vivint out there selling door-to-door -door home automation. And, uh, we're very different than them. We automate everything in your home, your movie, your home theater, your TVs, your audio, your pool. I mean, I can open my phone and turn on the hot tub and set the temperature. Uh, and we're sold in 7,500 retailers around the world. We have offices in about 20 countries. There's lots of that stuff that we do today in my current company, or my most recent company. But anyway, I didn't understand the channel. I didn't understand how it worked and uh, learned a lot. So we sold that company right when I was graduating from here. I had to go to work in, for this company that bought us in Dallas for two years. As soon as the two years was up, my business partner called me and says, let's do it again. So we decided to start another home automation company. And this one we called FAST. I hated that name. Uh, it stands for Practical Home Automation Systems Technologies. We started it in 1995. This is like before Coca-Cola had a website. This is like kind of pre-internet being a real broadly used thing. Uh, and we became the dominant player in the world in home automation, uh, a very big player. Uh, we've really focused you know, on, uh, for homes and not boardrooms, like this little touch panel right here that's running this room is from a company called Crestron. They have historically been one of the biggest players in that residential automation thing too, so typically the products were the things for boardrooms and also for homes were the same. We came in with a new product that was just for homes. Another thing we did is made the programming really easy. And we grew it from 95 to 97 in just two years from like we started designing the hardware and the software to sale was only two years and four months and we had grown to already a $36 million run rate in revenue. So fairly fast growth, became a fairly dominant player. The company that bought it uh, became a multi-hundred million dollar company using those products. Um, so now we had very strong non-competes in home automation and we had been traveling. Now let me talk about a couple things first. This time we built the right product. We knew what the product needed. We understood the channel. We understood who wanted it. We understood how to market it. We really understood those things. Uh, one of the things we didn't catch, we had no idea how hard it is to build hardware and scale up production and do those kinds of things. Not, we'd never, neither of us had ever done anything. My, I had been here at school uh, and writing signature card software and my business partner had been the brand manager of Tide at Procter & Gamble. So, I mean, you know, he knew about, like, going out with Ricky Rudd and the Tide Racing Team and marketing soap, but uh, we had no idea. And uh, we also didn't know how to scale a business. We, we, we kind of had the idea, we kind of knew how to pitch it, but we didn't know how to kind of make the business go and grow and uh, made a lot of mistakes. So one of the things we noticed, though, we had these non-compete agreements that we couldn't do anything else that was even in consumer electronics, anything similar, for two years. And we were traveling a lot with this business uh, and staying in hotel rooms. And we were noticing that hotel rooms just kind of stunk. We had these automated homes where my temperature is cooler in the evening and when I wake up in the morning, it comes up automatically. And I wake up with the blinds automatically opening my bedroom so the sunlight comes in and wakes me up gently with music coming on and maybe the news turns on five minutes later. You, you, we had these automated homes that could do all these fancy things. And then we'd go to a hotel and you got 13 TV stations and pay-per-view 
a crappy thermostat that like has a motion sensor on it, so if you fall asleep, it stops working. And uh, we thought we could make this better. We could automate hotel rooms. And so we started looking at building these wireless devices so that we could put a box in the room that would then talk to these wireless devices, and then based on your Marriott Rewards ID or something like that, it would remember your settings every time you stayed in a hotel so that the next time you came to a room, it would automatically make that room adjust to you. And we were very excited about it, and we, uh, we got Marriott to let us actually outfit a suite at the, right next to Bethesda, in Bethesda Marriott, right next to the headquarters of Marriott. And uh, one of the things we had decided is we needed a way to get data signals up to the room, and there was no reliable way to get data to the room. There was no Wi-Fi in hotels. There was none of this kind of stuff. The only wires you could count on was a piece of coax to the TV for the TV channels and a single pair, a twisted pair for phone wire, uh, uh, for the phone. And the movie providers who actually gave the hotels the TVs and the business model that they ran uh, owned the cable. So the only thing we had was the phone wire. So we had this idea of uh, having, that, having a DSL modem, essentially, which was a brand new technology on the desk that then could bridge wirelessly to all the devices in the room, and that's how we'd control the room. And as an afterthought, we thought, well, if there's a DSL modem in the room, maybe we could bring in a high-speed internet line into the building, and we could then sh people could plug their laptop in, and we could share that high-speed internet line and charge for it. Well, we built this room out. We'd built all the automation technology, because that's what we knew. We had built a model of the DSL modem and put it on the desk, but it was just got, it had a piece of lead inside of it, or steel, so that it would feel heavy. We had done no development on that. And we got Bill Marriott and the whole executive team to come in and walk through and look at this thing. And Bill just looked at us and he said, there's no way I'm spending 500 bucks a room to automate the hotel rooms. But I like that thing. That if we can charge $9.99 for the internet and get an extra revenue stream, we like that. Uh, will you do a trial hotel for us of that? We're like, sure, absolutely. We hadn't done anything, right? We had no technology, we designed nothing. We had nothing there, it was just an idea. And so we had four weeks to install the downtown Salt Lake City Marriott, and the opening day was going to be Brainshare, Novell's big uh, conference back then. And, and uh, we had to scramble big time. In the end, we became the dominant player in, in broadband and hotels. Uh, we, were the big, we were the third largest Wi-Fi hotspot operator in the world. We had all the Marriott's, all the Hilton's, most of the Starwoods, Mandarin Oriental in Asia, New Otani in Japan, S, you know, Sofitel and Novotel in Europe and most of the major world brands. We grew to north of $150 million in recurring annual revenue and uh, became a fairly big business. And, uh, but we had some challenges too. This time we kind of understood the market we wanted to go after. We, had, uh, we focused on the ideal customer experience. And this is a story I want to tell just real quick. One of the things to focus on if you're trying to solve, a, you know, first of all, if you build a business just because you like a technology, it's a bad idea. Second, if you, if you find a good idea that is a thing people need, you should really think about the ideal customer experience. Like, what does the customer want it to be? And this is going to require a little bit of history, but we decided the best way for this to work, this is before Wi-Fi, so you couldn't just have Wi-Fi in your laptop. Wi-Fi didn't exist. As a matter of fact, laptops didn't even have an Ethernet port on them. They don't anymore either now but they didn't have an ethernet port on them. And uh, so people had a PCMCA card slot and they had a floppy disk slot on their laptops back then. And uh, they often didn't even have the ethernet. They didn't have the dongle that had to make your ethernet port work. So there were a lot of challenges. But we thought, man, if they could just plug in and it would just work, that would be the ideal experience. Any of you guys technical at all and know what DHCP is? DHCP is Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Most of your laptops are doing that right now. You, you use it every single day. Your, your laptop gets on a network, you hook to the Wi-Fi, and it says, give me a network address that works here, and your machine goes and works. Well, in 1998, that's not how it worked. In 1998, most c companies would give each machine in there, they were just starting to have the internet in buildings, in, 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 in offices, and they would give each machine a static 10 dot network address, and then they would have a proxy server that your laptop would go through and then go out to the internet. And so if you just plugged in your ethernet, it wouldn't work because the networks wouldn't match. And so as my business partner kept pushing me saying, we want this thing to just plug in and it just works. I said, that's just not how the internet works. If they were all on DHCP, they could do that. And we looked at a couple competitors that were starting to play in that space. And what they did is they put a floppy disk in the closet of the hotel. And you could put the floppy disk in and that would load some software that would automatically, when you were in one of the hotels, change your settings over to DHCP. So your thing would get an address automatically and then change it back, hopefully 
They didn't always change it back, actually. There were some real problems. And I just said, we're going to have to do that same thing, because it just, that's not how the internet works. Well, we were at a trade show called High Tech. It's the hospitality trade show. And uh, we were both kind of running around the show and looking at things. And we met for lunch, and my business partner said to me, I just talked to a company, and they said they can make it work, uh, even if your laptop's not on a DHCP. And I said, really? And so I sat there just for a second, because I, I, I just sat there for a second, and I started looking at it, and I pulled out a napkin, and I started like uh, drawing a little picture to myself, and I, it took about eight minutes, and I figured out how to make it so that no matter what your laptop settings were, it would work. The funny thing is the company he talked to had only solved, there's about five problems you have to solve. They'd only solved one of them. We ended up solving all of them and got a lot of patents on that. And in the end, when we like were pitching Marriott and did trial hotels and we were bidding against AT&T and LodgeNet and a bunch of other big companies, uh, we won because they found that people were eight times more likely to get online with us than with our competitors because we had. But the funny thing is I just kept saying, no, it wouldn't work until I thought it was possible. Until someone else said it was possible, we figured it out. And I think that was a big lesson in my life is to not just say, no, it doesn't work that way. Stop and say, because I've solved it in literally like eight minutes as soon as I thought it was possible. But as long as I kept saying it wasn't possible, it didn't happen. Another challenge we had is this is a business that we really scaled pretty dramatically, and we didn't really know how to measure the business. We weren't doing things to watch, and I'll show you a couple examples, and also some timing of funding were some challenges. Uh, that's something the world did to us. It wasn't our fault, but we should have been more careful. So this is March of 2000 to January of 2002. And if you look over here on the left, that's the percentage of occupied rooms, percentage of rooms that have a person in them that actually bought the internet. When we did this business model, we would go into a hotel, we'd give them the stuff. It was free, 100% free. We'd give them uh, the, all the equipment. It cost us about 500 bucks a room. And we had a contract to do 50 hotels a month, and the average hotel had two to 500 rooms. So it was a huge capital outlay, and the break-even point was about 3%. We stopped losing money at 3%. There was enough people coming in that it kind of helped us do things. We felt like, you know, in the long run, 40, 50% of all people that stay in a hotel are going to use the internet. And that's absolutely true today. But this is back in the days of dial-up. Most people still did dial-up. They didn't know how to do this. But we started watching this percentage thing to watch our growth of our business. I think this is kind of fun to watch because if you look at this, just gotta, you see that there and that there? That's Labor Day and Fourth of July. See that? There's uh, or, or the Memorial Day and Fourth of July. There's Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, right? Come back up here, President's Day weekend, uh, Labor Day or Memorial Day, 4th of July. Look at this, though. Labor Day, 9-11, 2001. So we had this huge spike because people were stuck in hotels, right? By the way, we had a data center in the World Trade Center. <laughs> we, we lost our whole connection in New York, but we fortunately had redundancy. And then there's Thanksgiving and Christmas. So you could just watch. And we started watching the data and finding ways to watch what happens. This graph tells more, though. If you watch here, this is really messy, but this is from January of 2000 to March of 2001. One of the things we didn't notice, we started, we were going along and we thought, man, our cost is, the, the, the usage rate's going up, but we're having a problem. So right down here is this usage rate, the percentage of rooms that are using the system. And you can see like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you can see this kind of sine curve that goes here, sine wave. But this was our calls to purchase ratio. This is what percentage of purchases made a phone call to us. How many phone calls do we have divided by number of purchases? We were at 60, almost 70% right there. For every person that connected and bought from us, for every 10 that bought from us, seven called us. And by the way, to handle a call costs us about $12. <laughs> and we were charging $9.95. There was a big problem, right? And we weren't even watching that. We just noticed the costs were getting there, and we looked at it, and we, started, we, started, we built this chart, and we thought, oh my gosh, we've got a real problem. People were having a real hard time getting online. So we started diagnosing what that was, and we kind of caught it right here. And you can see, we had an immediate plummet. And we kind of watched it, and we tried to manage it down as things would happen. But here's an interesting thing. We did a software release right here. And right there, that space is about six weeks. See how it was kind of trending this way? But there was this bump up, 
we still weren't watching this as close. We were watching the call rate, but we weren't watching it closely enough every single day. We were watching it at the end of each quarter. So it took us six weeks, but we ended up having an issue. There was a firmware issue that in the software that went in the boxes that actually caused a problem. And if we'd just been watching this chart, we would have caught it immediately, but we didn't. Interesting thing, right here we did a software release too. No, right here, sorry. We did a software release right here. It bumped up, we found it, and then within a week we fixed it. Same here. And so we started measuring things really careful. And that's one of the cool things about Domo, actually, which I know has some activity here. They, get, they build software tools that make it easy to take this kind of data and turn it into data sets that you can watch every single day. And it's just really important to watch your business and figure out what things, are, what things you should be measuring. And that's actually hard. It's hard to figure out what the things are because every business is different. And the things you should be measuring are different. Now, if you're, in a, if you're just going to open a hotel, then there's the revenue per available room. There's certain things that every hotel watches. But if you have a business that's unique in any way, you've got to figure out what these are. And so we grew uh, Ibon fairly big, exited that, and then we decided to get back into home automation. Our non-competes were expired. But we wanted to do something totally different this time. The, the previous company was more about just building a dedicated home automation system. This time we said, let's go in there and let's make it available to the masses. Let's make it a very broadly av available thing. Let's make it less expensive. Let's, uh, let's make it so that regular people can have it. Let's make it retrofitable. All the home automation up until this time needed wires. You had to either reconstruct your house or tear down the sheetrock, or you had to build it new and put all kinds of wires in the walls. We said, let's make it retrofitable. Let's go after the whole world and let's kind of change how things work. So in 2003, we started that. Became the world leader in home automation. I do when I'm, if people ask what Control 4 does and I say home automation, people say, was well, that like Vivint? And Todd's a good guy. He's a friend of mine, and his company is much bigger than mine. But Vivint, when it comes to home automation, is to control for what Girl Scout cookies are to Nabisco. Um, when you go to Best Buy, it's control for. When you go to a home theater shop, it's control for. It's, uh, it, it's every light in your house, and it's all the music in your house, and it's your pool. It's automating everything in your environment. It's not about uh, a security system with maybe a door lock and a light switch and a doorbell. Um, it's not a bad product. It is a, it, it's a great product, but it, this is more about if you want to really have an automated home. I have a button by my bed I can push, and every light goes off in the house automatically. I've got motorized blinds in the rooms that, on the, west, on the east side of the house that they stay down until the sun gets above noon, then they come up. And then they close themselves automatically 30 minutes before, after sunset. Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, it's, it's really nice to integrate. It makes your home theater all my movies, they're all in DVD changers and on servers so my kids can't scratch the discs. Um, we have offices everywhere. Um, uh, grew to north of 180 million in revenues. We got to take it public on uh, August 2nd, 2013. We actually got to go and ring the bell on the NASDAQ. That was a pretty big blast to do that. And um, I've got a quick little video that explains what Control 4 does. You invest in your home to make it your castle. Installing the best appliances, gear, furniture, and technology to live large. With Control 4 Premium Home Automation Solutions, now all the devices and systems you own can work together perfectly, while you command it from your phone, your tablet, a touchscreen, or even a light switch. Shades go up when the sun rises. Texts alert you when the kids get home from school. The heat kicks on as you head home from work. Dim the lights and start a movie in one tap. Stream a different tune to every room or fill the whole house with music and check in from wherever you are, whenever you want. At the end of the day, arm the security system, lock the doors, and turn off all the lights right from your bedside. Control 4 makes it easy to automate virtually everything at home so you can enjoy a whole new level of comfort, convenience, energy efficiency, and peace of mind. Control 4. It's better living automatically. So I only stopped being involved with Control 4 at the end of last year, so it's only been a few weeks for me. Um, so this time, we really knew the market and the channel. We'd been there before. We knew how to build a company, and we built it quickly, and it worked. Uh, we built the right product. We knew how to scale the business. We knew how to do manufacturing. But a few mistakes we still made. Uh, initial messaging problems. So we had this idea. We'd been selling into this market where you automate everything. But it was super high-end homes, multi-million dollar homes. People would often spend a half a million dollars just on the automation system in the early days, back in the mid-90s when we were doing this. Uh, 
And so we said, let's build a product that can meet those needs, but that can also be scalable out to everybody. So we, when we entered the market, we had built a $400 controller that came with a remote control, and it generated an HDMI signal to go on your TV. So it had an HD signal, a high-res image, and so you could just push the four button, everything turned on right, the receiver turned on, went to the right input, the TV turned on, went to the right input, and you got an UI on the screen, it integrated music, it integrated lighting, and all these things, and you could get started for only 400 bucks. And it was retrofittable, so you could add it. So we came to the trade show pitching like, hey, you can automate your whole home, but you can get people started with just this $400 box and you can start people off. And so you know, right now you drive all the way up to Deer Valley to install that giant house. Now you can sell every house on the way. And we kind of pitched this whole new business model to these guys. Well, all they heard was $400 controller that you can put in a house that's a, that's a universal remote control. And that's not their business, right? Their customers, that we went, this trade show we went to that we we're gonna sell, we had not hit hard enough the message about everything else, that it did all these other things. And it was really frustrating because we showed the product, we got great response to the show, our booth was completely packed, uh, we had tons of people talking to us, and then no one signed up to be dealers. I mean, not no one, but significant, it wasn't, wasn't anything significant. And we realized we had a messaging problem. We hit too hard on this new business model thing and not enough on the fact that they could do everything. And I, I kind of, figured this out when I had a couple guys fly in to come talk to us about it. And I'd had several different meetings like this where people came in and they just said, look, we'd go to lunch and they'd say, look, we've done products, we like what you're doing, but we don't do brand new products, they're too buggy and you know, call us in a couple of years and we'll do it. We said, well, you said you'd come for the demo, let's go in the room. And we had this training room kind of like this room, big steep thing like this with a whole bunch of equipment on the front. And so I'd start showing them what it could do, like all the stuff it could do. And as soon as I showed them all that stuff, they'd look at me and they'd start asking more questions. Well, can it do this? Well, what about this? And what if I need to do this? And they realized it was actually a great product to do everything they needed, even though we hadn't messaged it right. And they would sign up. And so they'd say, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm going to sign up. And uh, so we thought, how do we make sure everyone understands this since we missed it, the big annual show? And so we decided to rent. I rented a couple of Utah State guys that were fresh out of college to be my roadies and... Uh, we did 50 cities in one summer. I personally went and pitched in every single city where we'd set up an entire system. And then we'd set it up at night. I'd get up in the morning, do the pitch till noon, go to lunch with some of the top dealers in that area. The guys would pack it back up, drive to the next city, set up in the night. They'd sleep in while I was up doing the thing. We caught a game at uh, Fenway. We caught a game at Wrigley. We got, you know, we, we got a lot of ball games in the evenings, but uh, just kind of brute force did it. But we started shipping that, that year in uh, May, and we did $7 million in revenue that year. And that gave us a base, and we did 23 the next year, and we did 48 the next year, and it just started cranking. But it, we made a big mistake not getting the message right, but we were able to kind of recover by just brute force. And it was, for the next four years, I did a summer tour, and my family would come with me, and it would be interesting. We also had some focus issues. As we grew, there were just a million opportunities. Utilities wanted to do home automation as part of meter reading, and, and there were a lot of distractions, and, and we didn't focus as well as we probably should have. And a lot of people will tell you, if you look at entrepreneurship, that you should focus on doing one thing and doing it right and doing it really well. So my current business is a company called Silverview. We do post-acute care transition management. Uh, we help patients that basically have had surgeries and might need other services when they go home, or they might need to go to another facility do those transitions. So you might be going to a skilled nursing facility for a week, you might be going to rehab, you might need home health care, you might need a, a hospital bed in your house. We essentially are a service that helps make those things happen. Uh, we're in 100 hospitals today. Uh, it's too early to really talk about the mistakes, except we've actually pivoted, I think, four times since we started this business, which you could say are mistakes, but I actually count that fact as a success story. Starting off looking at something, realizing that's not the right thing, pivoting, and the business model we're on right now, frankly, is we were in selling something else to the hospitals, and they said, this is great, but what I re you're really close to what I really need, which is this. And we said, you know what, that's what we're gonna do. So let me talk about what I did do right all the time. I'm willing to bet that nobody here knows what happened in June of 1979 that changed my life forever, unless you've seen me say this before. Anyone ever wanna guess what happened in June of 1979? Most of you weren't even around. That was a yeah, decade later, actually. Uh, the Apple II computer. The original Apple II computer, 1979. 
Uh, the Apple I was a piece of part plywood with a circuit board on it. It wasn't really, there were only like 50 of them ever made. Uh, the Apple II computer came out, and I didn't like wood shop and metal shop. And in my middle school, you had to either do wood shop or metal shop or home ec. Or they came up with this other class called uh, Mind Benders. It was the nerd class. And we did a fundraiser. We went out and did a fundraiser and bought one of these Apple IIs when it first came out. And I loved that thing. I, learned how, I, I immediately learned how to do everything you could possibly do on it. I asked my mother for Christmas for the programmer's reference manual. For my birthday, I got a box of floppy disks. I mean, I, 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 didn't want, I didn't care about anything else. I loved this thing. It was my favorite thing in the world, and it became my passion. What's funny is right after this is when my uncle called me and says, I'll teach you how to build a computer, which I referred to earlier. And he showed me how to build my own computer that I was able to write my, I mean, I soldered it. And, and he told me, you don't want to be a computer programmer. There's going to be no money in that. Everyone's going to program their own computers. You need to be an electrical engineer. So I came here to school, enrolled in E, applied for the program, got into the program, but as I started seeing what was going on, I realized that even the double E's really just put a microprocessor on a board and then programmed the microprocessor. Or they put an FPGA on the board and programmed the FPGA. No one, Control 4 has 185 engineers. Five of them are hardware. Even though there's 300 hardware products, 180 of them are software engineers. He told me I was just a mistaken, but I said, no, I want to be a programmer. This is what I want to do. I want to be able to make these things do things. And I would say that the most important thing in the world is follow your passion. Uh, do something that you get excited about. Uh, you've heard the quotes, if you do what you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. There's, there's a million different uh, things like that. But why does passion really matter? It gives you perseverance. If you love something, you'll deal with it. And the bottom line is, what gets you through the hard times? Because they always come. I've, not, I've had five businesses that have become kind of uh, world-leading businesses. Uh, and every one of them, there was at least one moment, and usually two or three or four, where I was absolutely certain we were going to fail. I knew that we were going to fail. I knew that it was over. I knew that we would not be successful. I remember installing that first Marriott four weeks after Bill Marriott said did it, and we didn't have product that did what he said, and we kind of threw something together, and we're installing this, and he says, you know what, whether we go with you guys or not, or work with you guys from here on out, it will depend on what that general manager of that hotel says. We go and install this thing in this hotel, we have two weeks to do it, and it doesn't work. And so I end up in a room on the 16th floor, kind of programming, trying to figure out what's going on, and looking at meters, and trying to figure out what's going on. And we had to reprogram the system, I think, six times, which meant putting a chip in each box in each room, opening the box and putting a chip in. So we had re-entered every room at least six times. I think by the end, it was like 12 times we'd gone back into every single room in that hotel. Well, hotel, the worst thing you can do in a hotel is when you're doing a maintenance thing, they, they're really careful about scheduling, even light bulb changes, so that you don't enter the room very often because you don't want to disturb guests. In that period of two weeks, we entered every room 12 times. I didn't sleep five days straight at one point because we're trying to get it right and it wasn't working. And I remember one time my family came up to visit, and this is back when the downtown Marriott in Salt Lake, there was a mall there attached to it that's different than the mall that's attached to it now. And uh, there was a food court in the basement. And I remember meeting them to eat and just sitting on this fountain down there, I knew we were going to fail. I knew it was over. I thought I should just go home with my family. <laughs> this is pointless. But in the end, I kissed them goodbye and went back in. And, and uh, we, we got it working. It was still kind of buggy, but we got it working for the show. And then came the day, two days later, when the VP of room operations at Marriott headquarters was calling the general manager of this hotel, asking how the installation went. And then he was going to call us right after. And so we get that phone call. And he told, told us the GM of that hotel said it was the most seamless integration of technology he'd ever seen in his entire career. <laughs> I know he wasn't in the same building I was in because it was awful. But it's, if you have passion about what you're doing, you'll stick it out when it gets hard. Because it always gets hard. And the people that succeed aren't the people that had everything go easy. They're the ones that don't quit. Adam Grosser was a board member at Control 4, and one of the things he told us is that growing from 1 to 10 million, almost any charismatic guy can make that happen if he has a decent business. Like, you can build a dry cleaner to that, right? And even 100 million to a billion is fairly easy, but I won't use the language he uses because it's uh, vulgar. But he said growing from 10 to 100 million is just as hard as it can be because that's where you have to do stuff. And it takes passion to give perseverance to get through that because it requires just massive challenges anyway.
So the ways I totally lucked out, an amazingly tolerant wife, who's, uh, I've, uh, I've uh, traveled nonstop. I, I have three and a half million miles on Delta. I don't know, yeah. Two years in a row, I was the number one traveler out of the Utah hub, more than the congressmen and senators. Uh, this first guy that believed in me, the guy that I knew here from school, he was a smart guy needed funding to boot. I've had something very unique. I've had the same business partner for 25 years. I was a sophomore in my undergrad here at BYU. He was already a Wharton MBA, the brand manager of Tide. And I had an idea of a company, but he came in and helped me. And uh, you know, we've raised over 500 million in venture capital through our career, built multiple large companies. This guy too, just unwavering ethics and persistence to him. And then a group of guys that have been here through multiple ventures. They, we have the same guys that kind of come along with us every single time. It's actually not that way. It's, we have the odd guys and the even guys. Because usually there's non-solicit agreements that we can't take them. So like almost none of the control four people are at Silverview. But Silverview's full of IBON people. And, uh, and it, it's kind of worked that way. Uh, I want to talk a quick note on ethics and religion. And uh, I was going to give a couple examples. I may be running out of time, so I'm not going to. But this one, the second great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Life's far too short to work in an environment where people don't treat each other well. I love it in the early startup phase. We really try to make sure the business feels like a family. Like we took the entire company to Lake Powell this summer on a houseboat that my business partner owns. Uh, we try to do things to make it feel like a family. And you, I said, you know what, we could probably get 10% more sales if we hired really cutthroat sales guys. But I'd rather not have that environment. I'd rather have an environment that feels like family. Uh, you definitely need to create an environment of achievement and accountability, otherwise you won't be successful. But don't forget kindness. It's, it's, life's way too short for that kind of stuff. And another personal note on religious, religion uh, in business. Uh, first, our Heavenly Father will help guide us in all our endeavors. This includes business. He wants to help us, and he will. Not just in your personal decisions, but in what you're doing in business. And you can't have a business life that's separate from a religious life. It never works. I've had employees that I watch that do that. And they behave one way on Sunday and one way during the week. Faith is the foundation for being a better businessman. Also, faith drives action. If you believe you're going to be successful, you will be successful. Another one I like to say, God means it when he says, and whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, which is right, believing that you shall receive, behold, it shall be given you. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. God wants us to be successful. He wants us to live abundantly. That doesn't mean you're going to be rich if you believe or things like that, but he wants to bless you and he wants you to believe and he wants to help you and he wants to make it happen. And the truth is the people that are successful are the people that believe they're going to be successful. I know of 250 home automation startup companies that have failed. I can name 30 in this valley that have started and failed. I've started three and every one of them has become successful and become a leader. And I frankly believe it's, we definitely had the product right, but it's because we believe we were going to be successful. And the people that succeed are the people that believe they're going to be successful because if you believe you're going to be successful, you stick it through and do it, and you do what needs to happen. You do what it takes. We'll do questions upstairs. I wanted to make one other comment about work-life balance. Um, and if you, have you seen the interview with Steve Jobs when someone asked him about work-life balance? It's an interesting interview. He says, there's no such thing. That's a stupid comment. No one should even think about work-life balance. You do what you're passionate about, and you don't worry about the other stuff. Of course, if you look at his life and some of the challenges he had, most of it is kind of obvious. But I wasn't willing. That, that was important to me. Work-life balance was important to me. I was not willing to uh, uh, give up a family. And I have lots of friends. Uh, the, kind of the entrepreneurial, especially in the tech world, community in Utah is very small. We're all friends. We all know each other. We... And I've watched lots of my best friends uh, be very successful in business, but have their marriages fall apart and their family life stinks. And the truth is, if you're very successful and can kind of count all these things you've done and, and uh, you've got a bunch of money and live in a big house and can go on fantastic vacations, whatever like that, if your family life is ruined, it's pretty shallow and hollow. Um, a couple things I learned. One of the things I did uh, my whole career is I, I definitely was willing to travel to get things done but weekends were sacred. So there'd be sometimes on weeks where I'd leave Monday, and I'd say, you know what, I'll be back Friday. And, but I'd always come back Friday. There were even times when I was out with other employees of mine, 
and we were in Europe one week, and we were going to be in Asia the next week, and we got invited to golf and go to that big fancy hotel in Dubai, the big one that looks like a sail out in the water, and we had special VIP access, and I said, no, guys, I'm, I got on a plane Friday morning, came home, and then got another plane Sunday night and went to Asia, right, while they all went and golfing and did all this stuff. You have to make it a priority. Uh, the other thing I did is I realized that almost every weeknight when I was on the road, I'd go to dinner with a client, but then I'd go back to my room and do email. But then most people, when they're home, if they're busy in a startup, they, they, they stay in the office late because they're trying to get things done. And I thought, well, wait a second. If while I'm on the road, I can go to a business dinner with someone and then go back to the room and do the work. Why can't when I'm home, I go home and have dinner with my family and then get back on my computer and do the same thing? Why is it when I'm home, I need to stay in the office, but when I'm on a business trip, I go out to dinner? And I made that a policy uh, about 10 years ago that when I'm home, I'm going to go home at 5, always. And if there's lots of other work to do, I'll do it later. But I don't have to do it right now. And we're a couple minutes away. Do we do questions here if I stop? Or? Let's go to news wrap now and then we'll go to news wrap. Anyway, thank you.